Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the first episode of Misfits and Moguls. I am your host, Melissa Geisinger, and this is a fun experiment in live video streaming to podcast. <laughs> um, I am broadcasting to you today from Santa Rosa, California, where it is a beautiful, what, 72 degrees outside. And uh, welcome to my bedroom, aka my office. And I'll show you a little bit about what's going on here. We've got a snoozing, wait a minute, snoozing dog and cat. My cat is snoring very loudly. I'm not sure if you can hear it. <laughs> um, but um, let me tell you a little bit about the show. So Misfits and Moguls is a live streamed video podcast that hands the mic to your everyday entrepreneurs from struggling freelancers to successful millionaires. It allows them to tell their stories in an unfiltered way. We record live, which means no two things, uh, which means two things. Uh, number one, anything can happen, including my tripping my own over my own words constantly. And number two, you can be a part of the live show by submitting your comments or questions to either Facebook or YouTube. If you're listening to the audio only version of this podcast, then I encourage you to join us live for our next show. All the information, show details, past and future can be found on the website www.misfitsandmoguls.com. Today's guest, my first guest, I am so, so thrilled. Um, I have Greg Carter here from Cloverdale, California. Greg owned a local computer business and was a freelance software developer before mostly retiring when he sold his business in 2014. He uh, started his career in IT while he was in the Marine Corps in the 1980s, and he moved from programming mini computers and mainframes to PCs. And um, he became almost entirely self-employed by 1994 and went on to start Cloverdale Computer in 2009, which is the business that I know him for. I, we met when I ran an organization called WIMP, Web and Interactive Media Professionals. And we computer geeks uh, local to Sonoma County keep to our tight circles. And so <laughs> Greg and I met through that. Um, he was actually re recently diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And while his health situation looks bleak, his outlook on life remains bright and positive and full of humor. He is an inspiration to me, and I hope that he becomes the same for you here today. Uh, today's show is sponsored by me. <laughs> Uh, once I was a quasi successful self-employed website designer and I walked away from that in 2017 after my house burned down in a wildfire and my son was born with a special, with needing special medical needs. Realizing just how much the idea of home meant to me, I decided to become a mortgage advisor. All I ask for in exchange of you enjoying today's episode is that you think of me anytime you think of your home finances. For more information, you can visit www.gohomewithmelissa.com. And now I will bumble about this, <laughs> this interface to introduce you to our guest, Greg Carter. Greg, can you hear me? I hear you, Melissa. Great. All right. I think I did that successfully. I am impressed. Yay. First try. <laughs> now, Greg, before, um, before we get started, I want to, I want to try something out and you are going to be my guinea pig. Okay. Okay. So because this show, we believe so much in honesty and transparency, we might, uh, get a little carried away with the questions sometimes and okay so just in case we ask something that is too personal or you just don't want to talk about i want us to pick a safe word <laughs> <laughs> um binoculars okay binoculars all right kids you sure you saw that let's see <laughs> 
Uh, now it's going to test my spelling abilities. Binoculars. Sure. Okay. All right. Our safe word is binoculars. All right. So if you are tuned in uh, into the audience and <laughs> and Greg says the word binoculars, you need to make sure that I hear it. Okay. You need to call me out on it. <laughs> we'll, stop. we'll stop. We'll honor the safe word. Okay. 40 years ago. A friend and I used that as a safe word. If we were at a party, whoever said binoculars meant, let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> that was usually him. And I usually said, you mean telescope, right? <laughs> oh, great. Okay, so the format of this, of this show is, um, it's live. So we've got audience watching our show live and they on occasion will be submitting comments so if you are watching and you submit a comment or a question anytime during the show uh, we will see it and be able to share so more or less kind of what i'm imagining the how the timeline will go is we'll do our thing on an interview and you'll tell your story and i'll ask some questions and then we'll kind of open it up to the audience um, questions from there so Great. the subject of wait a minute where did i go the subject of today's interview of today's episode is what happens when a freelancer dies and before all of my friends and family get mad at me <laughs> you know, some already have some have been like well that's awfully grim well, it's, greg thought of it okay so he gets <laughs> that's true you said it right at the end of our talk last week. And I, I did. Said, Can I use that? <laughs> All right, Greg. I think we should start. Let's start at the beginning. I think that your story is really unique um, because it, um, you know, you you started out kind of like mo most of most of the people who are into computers today. Is we had we had a pull from a very young age, right? Yeah. You were in the uh, in the computer club in high school, right? So tell me more about that. Yeah, back in uh, probably 1974, this uh, retired aerospace guy, brilliant guy, decided he wanted to be a teacher, horrible teacher. And uh, so he brought his knowledge of computers and started a computer club. So he taught us how to program in Fortran, if you've even heard of that. And we would do our programs, uh, punch the key, punch them onto little uh, hollow earth cards. They were called key punch cards. And go down to the school district office and run them on their IBM 1401 mainframe. And so the, we'd run the, you know, the program and lots of churning and clacking and rattling sounds as the cards were read. And then the printer would print out, hello world. And, Eject to the end of the page, and the crowd went wild. But that was my first exposure <laughs> to uh, computers, and I was hooked. Was there a um, was there a social stigma back then to being a computer geek? You know, it was such a new thing. There was no social stigma to being a computer geek. There was already a social stigma to being a geek, and I was deeply in that camp. But the computer part didn't even matter. That's one of the reasons I liked, I think, that I was drawn to computers was I was such a geek. I didn't understand people. They didn't understand me. And uh, computers were something that was predictable. They would do the same thing every time based on the same inputs. And so if there was a problem, I knew it was with me and I knew how to fix it. So that was what I had in place of a social life. Right. Yeah. So, what did you uh, what did you do after high school? Uh, well, being a geek, of course, the first thing I thought to do was go off and join the Marine Corps, <laughs> uh, where I fit in almost as well as I had in high school. And uh, so, I was in the Marine Corps. Was trained as a radio repairman, so I was a geek in the Marine Corps as well. And uh, about uh, nineteen seventy nine and eighty. The battalion I was in got a computer. It was this big, lockable IBM Series 1, what they call 
ruggedized, which meant it weighed four times as much as it should. It had a big waterproof gasket around the lid. And everybody was terrified of the thing, which worked out for me because I had pissed off so many of my superiors, or they thought they were my superiors anyway, that I was in danger of being sent over to Okinawa to clean the trains for a year in a foreign land. But they had this computer. Everybody was terrified of it except me. And so suddenly I had value again. So that was my first professional work as a computer geek. So my next question about uh, do you ha have a hard time uh, with authority would be probably. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's uh, I didn't have a great time with authority in school. Certainly didn't have a great time with authority with my parents. And so I joined the Marine Corps, but that didn't take either. I only went AWOL once and managed to squeeze a honorable discharge out of the deal. But uh, <laughs> that was by the skin of my teeth. So, yeah, me and authority never quite got along. Did you ever ask your superiors the question why? Why you're supposed to do something? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they had the same answer my mom did. Because I said so, God damn it. <laughs> Which never really, I don't know, it never resonated with me. So what did you uh, what did you do for work then beyond the Marine Corps after your honorable discharge? Yeah, my barely honorable discharge. <laughs> uh, I went and got a job doing data entry for a temp company. And, and I wasn't, I mean, I was good at data entry. I was pretty fast. But that wasn't what I was interested in. So I started hounding the gal that was the programmer. And hanging out with the uh, other person that was the data processing manager, as they called the title back then, and started learning to program in what they called Data General Business Basic on a Data General Mini Computer. So within a few months, I wasn't doing data entry more anymore. I was programming, and then when the data processing manager quit, I got her job. So within, I don't know. Nine months of starting there as a temp person, I was the exalted data processing manager making uh, $8.65 an hour. <laughs> That's big money. That's more than big I made job. Yeah. So from there, I went on, did that for a couple of years. Guess what? Had a lot of run-ins with authority there. And uh, <laughs> my wife got pregnant with our first child and got laid off from her job. The company was going out of business, and so she was unhirable. So I got another temp job doing data entry uh, at night. So I'd work all day, drive from one end of Orange County to the other, do data entry all night, back home, apply, lather, rinse, repeat. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you were... So I think... Um... Yeah, it's a it's hard to be in the position of being sole provider, right? Yeah, yeah it was pretty and challenging. At what at what point did you decide that it was time for you to uh, go out on your own? Well, I'd worked for by that point. That was about 1994 that I really went out on my own. Uh, so in the intervening, say, 12 or 13 years, I'd worked for a computer services company doing programming and analysis and such. And then had gone to work for uh, an auto parts company, which had been a client of the computer services company, took care of all their IT stuff and visually worked into other business functions, purchasing and uh, banking relationships and that sort of thing. So I, I feel silly. I feel like a broken record talking about authority. But uh, <laughs> sensing a pattern. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So one day, uh, we had just been told the day before there would be no raises that year, no cost of living raises, and one of the owners pulled up in a brand new car. And I pointed out the window and said, "Hey, Steve, look, there goes my raise." Well, we go back to one of the owners, and. Uh, <laughs> That was pretty much it for me. So within a couple of weeks, I was laid off, which is awesome because <laughs> then I could get unemployment instead of being fired, 
which is what it really was. And uh, so a bunch of my friends got together and said, we're all going over to Vern's house to talk about this. And, oh, my God, it was this big thing. And uh, so we all went over to Vern's house. Everybody grabbed a six-pack of beer. And we sat around. And it was funny. Everybody was like, are you okay, man? I'm like, are you kidding me? I wanted out of this fucking job for two years. So, <laughs> I was partying in celebration. And eventually they all came around. They were bummed that I wasn't going to be there anymore, especially since I did a lot of running interference for them with the owners and the uh, general manager who was a flaming asshole, basically. And uh, so that was when I said, no, no more. People say, you're looking for a job? It's like, no, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm done with this shit. So. Wow. So yeah. you, did you then start freelancing? or? Um... I spent about a year and a half, two years, as the primary caregiver for our uh, second son, mm -hmm. who was born shortly after I got laid off. So I was uh, spending a lot of time with him. My wife was back to working at that point. So I spent a lot of time at home with him, which is fantastic. And uh, then I got a call from a previous uh, employer who wanted me to come back on a contract basis, not as an employee. And that was the beginning of my uh, freelance career. Mm -hmm. And where were you living at the time? Orange County, Southern Orange California. California. Yeah. 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 And so uh, eventually you moved up to Northern California, right? To I Atlanta. did. Yeah, I was working for this uh, this guy that I did some work for before, working on a freelance basis for a multi-level marketing company. Hey. And uh, so I had an interesting experience. of I was sitting at my desk one day working away, and in walks a sheriff, and he says, take your hands off the keyboard. Like, okay, man, whatever you want. So they simultaneously did this in every office in the company, raided the company, because Ooh. they were apparently engaged in all sorts of multi-level marketing style shenanigans. <laughs> I knew nothing about it. I just worked there. I just wrote the programs. But uh, the guy with the gun said, take your hands off the keyboard. I took my hands off the keyboard. So I was back to being... you'll listen to, right? Exactly, yeah. So uh, I did some more, a little more freelance work in Southern California, uh, including attempting to farm myself out as a Y2K con uh, consultant. Oh, you saved which the world. I saved the world, yeah. Oh, it was you. funny. I never actually got much business in the Y2K world, uh, but I certainly tried to farm myself out there for, uh, for doing that kind of work. So I was looking around for work, and I was suckered back into the world of employment briefly by a company in Petaluma, an insurance company. And they brought me up to Northern California. We were looking forward to the move anyway. My wife and I were uh, kind of both between jobs at that point. We thought, what the heck? So we moved up to Northern California, and I uh, never looked back. Nice. The insurance company job, as is wont to happen with me, didn't last for very long. But we were somewhere we wanted to be, and so we stuck around. And finally, my Y2K thing came back after two and a half years. And I got a call from a company in Southern California and said, Hey, we've been putting this off too long, but our whole company is run on the system that's not Y2K compliant. How would you like to come rewrite from the ground up a system for us to run our business? So they were in Southern California. I was in Northern California. I had no intention of moving. And so the next chapter was born. So I spent about a year writing uh, from scratch a system for this company to run on, uh, which still running to this day 20 plus years later heck yeah yeah that's cool yeah 
So that was exciting. Yeah. So how how did you go from being a freelance programmer to opening up a computer store in basically the county's smallest town? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. The uh, the guy that owned the company that I had written the system for, I worked for him for quite a number of years on a freelance basis and uh, was part-time. He was happy. I was happy. Got to spend a hell of a lot of time with my kids as they were growing up. But all good things must come to an end. And his industry changed. He backed way back on what he was doing and didn't need me anymore, except for the occasional uh, little piece of help here and there. So I was casting about, I got to make some money somehow. Um, I don't really have any contacts anymore in the IT business. So what can I do? Well, I think I'll see if anybody locally can use me. I had a lot of contacts in town. My kids have been involved in a lot of youth activities. And my wife and I were both involved in the Kiwanis Club, Service Club. So I sort of just let it be known, hey, if you need any help with your computer, let me know. And uh, I was really hoping for some more application, uh, custom software stuff. Not much ever came my way. <laughs> but I ended up... Being a high demand in Clover. Yeah, Day. exactly, right? Uh, so I ended up running a computer business here in Cloverdale. And you had doing, a storefront? Yep. Right. At a storefront, did hardware, uh, you know, trans people get new systems, transfer their stuff over. Back when that was a lot harder than it is now. Uh, setting up the peripherals, networks, wireless networking. That was just kind of coming into its own uh, business networks. And the constant churn of Windows 2000, Windows XP, Windows uh, Vista. Thank you, Windows Vista. You made me a lot of money. Windows 7, Windows 8. Thank you, Windows 8. I earned a lot of money. Windows 10 and so on. So uh, took care of that kind of problem for people. And uh, virus removal, which is now kind of a thing of the past, that used to be probably 70% of my business was virus removal and yeah, trying to clean yeah, up after that uh, crap. Yeah, people aren't having to install so many programs as they were before being sent a bunch of things in email. Yeah. They used to, huh? Yeah. But it's a much cleaner know? world out there. Did you uh, did you do a lot of a lot of research and um, and footwork before you started <laughs> your company or uh, was it Not, a wing and a prayer? It was totally wing and a prayer. <laughs> there was one other guy in town doing computer work, and he had a little storefront and actually had a couple of computer systems. Uh, if you remember back when they would have the uh, the plexiglass sides and all the flashing lights. I suppose gamers and stuff still do that, but you know we had some stuff like that trying to get people's attention. And uh, so, as far as I could tell, he was the big leagues, and I was the upstart, flying below the radar. So I just hoped he was busy enough that the stuff he didn't do, you know, I I was hoping to catch his table scraps basically. Mm. And um, was he much competition for you? You know. Not for very long. Within a few weeks, a few months at the most, people started coming to me and saying, you know that guy, the tech for me, was the name of his business. Not a gimmicky name, but I can see it in my work. It's like, yeah, the tech for me turned out not to be the tech for me. <laughs> he, he was absconding with people's money, so I was told, I don't want any libel or slander lawsuits against me. Oh but people were coming to me saying he was taking their money. He was promising to buy them computers and not buying them. He had their computers and wouldn't give them back. Uh, the person that had been his business partner had similar problems. Uh, so I don't know what happened. So your one competition was he was a he was a, a thief and a crook. <laughs> barely so, yeah. So he skipped town and suddenly... I was the big man about town 
Hey. Tried to rescue all these other people that had been left high and dry by this guy. Yeah. So I not only got his table scraps, but I got his main course and his appetizer too. Oh man. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, so how was business then once you became the, the, uh, the big dog? It was good. I was, uh, I started, like I said, with nothing, started working out of my, uh, spare bedroom and sharing that with my wife as her office. And, uh, Got some, rented some space downtown from a friend uh, after a few months, and I was profitable from the first month. I think my first month's expenses were a stack of business cards from Vistaprint, so I was profitable from day one. But it grew month after month. There was apparently not only this guy, but there was an untapped uh, demand for people not to have to drive down to Santa Rosa 45 minutes yeah. and drop their computer off into the black hole that is Best Buy Geek Squad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where, you know, they charged twice as much as I did and took four times as long wow. to do the same job if they did it as well as me, which in all due modesty, they didn't. So, yeah, it grew like mad almost from day one. What's the difference between, you know, just being a, a freelancer doing, um, you know, software and maybe like the har- the mi- miscellaneous hardware fixing versus running a retail service business where you have a storefront where people can just walk in anytime that they want and ask for things? It was very different. I was used to having long-term relationships with clients. Obviously, my previous one lasted 10 years and counting at that point. And uh, so I was just having these long-term relationships and building stuff together over time. And in all honesty, having my expertise valued uh, in a way that seemed commensurate with what I was offering. And suddenly, I had all kinds of people. There were certainly people that valued my expertise. They'd walk in and they were in awe that I had any idea what to do and happy to pay for my expertise. Then there were also plenty of people that would walk in. I have a lot of sympathy now for auto mechanics. They would walk in and say, well, this will be fast and easy for you, which is not so thinly veiled code for, I don't want to pay you more than 10 bucks for this. And uh, so, and everything in between. So I suddenly was dealing with this vast cross section of humanity that is retail sales and service instead of the, fairly rarefied uh, relationship industry that I've been in before. Yeah. Did you ever get, I'm sure you got people coming in saying that they had an emergency, they needed something right away. Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I would have people. If you're listening to the podcast version, he just rolled his eyes so hard. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I had typically, I hate to say this, other small businesses or sole proprietorships people would come in and they'd say, oh my God, I need this. I have a client. I've got to get this information off my crashed hard drive, deeply infected computer that I can't even log in on or whatever. I got to get my information back. My entire business is counting on it. I need this Monday morning for our client meeting. My life is in your hands. Please help me. And so they'd go weeping out the front door on Friday afternoon. So I'd work on their problem. And sometimes more than once after dinner with my family on Sunday night, get in the car and go back down to the office. I promised Joanne that I would get her computer back to her Monday morning. She really needs it. I really feel for her situation. By God, I'm going to do everything I can. So I might be there from nine o'clock till midnight working on her computer. Monday morning rolls around. I got it done. Came in early Monday morning. The last of the scans had finished. The hard drive had been cloned. Throw it all back together in time for her to pick it up at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock rolls around. No Joanne. 10.30 rolls around. No Joanne. 
Finally, I called Joanne. Joanne, as I promised, your computer is ready. And I'm expecting her to throw herself at my feet, you know, call me or her best friend forever and rush down with her checkbook to get her computer rack and leave me a nice juicy tip. That's not what happened. Oh, boy. Joanne says, oh, yeah, sorry. I called my client and put that off to till Wednesday. And I was so stressed out. I'm taking the day off. Can I pick it up tomorrow? Damn it, Joanne. Damn it, Joanne. Exactly. <laughs> so that was a pretty dramatic case. But that kind of thing happened not infrequently. And I discovered I was caring more about these people, right. their problems, than they were. Yeah. Now, that was counterbalanced by the little old lady in our retirement com community here who would call me in and ask for help to get her set up on Skype with her grandkids. And I get it done in 20 minutes, and she'd insist on paying me for an hour. Yeah. So, again, I had some fantastic relationships. Those are the moments that keep us going. Exactly. Because I, I, I can relate. I can relate to what you're saying big time about investing so much of yourself, you know, that it really just affects you on a personal level. And that one client who's either unhappy with you or disrespects you in a way that you feel is unfair, it, it hits home. And that yeah. can have a really serious effect long term. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was a, a balance between, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. And a lot of people were just sort of middle of the road, do your work, get your money. Uh, but over time, it took its toll. Yeah. And so, I started to get really burned out. Yeah. And fed up with the whole thing. And that was when I knew I had to get out. So what, what was the plan then? What did you do? I had a guy that, as I had grown, had been working for me first five or 10 hours a week and then 20 hours a week. Pretty soon, we're both working 40 hours a week plus. And I said, Ben, you've been doing this for me for a couple of years now. I know you. My customers know you. I know you'll take care of them. So here's the deal. I'm going to sell the business to you or I'm going to shut it down. I'm not going to sell it to some fly-by-night guy that I don't know that might take care of people and might not. After the nightmare of the guy that had been in town before me, I wasn't going to take any chances. Yeah. So he said, okay, I'll buy the business. And so I went from having the business to being blessedly free and went from working 60 or 70 hours a week to not working at all. And uh, it was a beautiful thing. And Ben, who bought the business from me, went on to uh, hire my son, as a matter of fact, yeah. and uh, build the business into far more than I had built it into, and be very successful. And he's still going to this day, and uh, nobody could be happier or prouder of my, of my baby than me. It's in good hands, and it's flown the coop, and I'm not responsible for it anymore, and everybody's happy. That must be a good feeling, knowing that the business is going to, I mean, quite literally live longer, like outlive you, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, It's now been out of my hands for longer than it was in my hands. So he's owned it longer now than I did. So, Amazing. and you know, what are the statistics? 80% of businesses fail in the first year, yeah. 90 or 95% in the first five to 10 years. And it's been well over 10 years, so almost 12 years now, and it's still going strong. So uh, that's not all me, but uh, I'm pleased as much that that's the way it is. Wonderful. So yeah. how, did you, how did you go about selling the business and pricing it out and doing all? <laughs> I did that about as scientifically as I got into the business. I looked at it, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I'm not a real brilliant guy, okay? I was a good programmer and analyst, but everything else, I don't know if you can hear my life. My wife is watching this live in her office and cackling, <laughs> cackling aloud. So uh, I thought, well, I wonder what Ben will pay me for this business. 
and I came up with a number. And then I thought, well, I wonder what it would be way too much. And I came up with a number. So I split the difference and thought, okay, we can negotiate from there. And so I told him my number, and he said, okay, which was my first clue that I was starting out way too low. <laughs> uh, but he didn't argue, so we shook hands, and that was that. Amazing. I've never been really particularly interested in money. Um, obviously, I walked away from perfectly good, much higher paying jobs uh, in corporations to go off and be a, you know, a freelance guy yeah. and do my thing. So I've never been that interested in money or driven by money. And uh, so that was kind of par for the course for me. So if you had to, if you could go back and do it all over again, would you change anything? Not a thing. Not a thing. How has your perspective on your career changed since your diagnosis? Um, you know, there's this sort of uh, stereotypical response, right? Of, wow, uh, I wish I hadn't toiled away in the salt mines for so many years for some thankless job and now I'm not even going to make it to retirement age. And fortunately, for whatever reason, I stopped toiling away in the salt mines a long time ago. And I mostly lived my life the way I wanted to. Uh, I didn't have a lot of security, didn't have a lot of money. But when I decided it was time to walk away from something, I walked the fuck away, mm. uh, no matter what. And my wife can tell you sometimes... It's like, how are we going to pay the rent? How are we going to feed the kids? And I mean, it wasn't quite that bad, but we had our moments. But it's like, no, man, I'm done. So I'm out. And to her credit, she always backed me, and we always figured out a way to do it. So I'm after I sold the business in 2014, I kept having these ideas that I should make money. And my financial planner, if I was smart enough to have one, would have probably been screaming at that at me. But <laughs> nothing really stuck. I actually went to the folk work for the post office for a few months, delivered mail. Oh, I love being outside and walking around. But boy, talk about a bureaucracy and crap from one end of the day to the other. So I didn't last there but a few months. But I thought about starting other businesses, had some grandiose plans, but I just couldn't get into it. And so I didn't. So I guess, if anything, my diagnosis makes me really glad that I didn't wait for my diagnosis to go, oh, shit, I forgot to live. Right. I forgot to have a life. I forgot to do things in a way that's commensurate with who I am, that's congruent with what I want out of life. Uh, so I'm mostly grateful that... Uh, you listen to that little voice in your head. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And we all have that little voice. And yeah. I think um, yes, yeah, so, some of us are more in tune with it than others. What advice would you give somebody who has a tendency of ignoring that little voice? Do whatever it takes to listen. You are... You're stuck with you. You're all alive. Everything else is negotiable. Relationships come and go. Jobs come and go. Careers come and go. Everything else is negotiable. Everything else is potentially temporary. But you're stuck with you. You're it. So learn to learn who you are if you don't already know. Get outside in nature. I'm a big proponent of that. And listen to that voice. Read, meditate, contemplate. If you need to take a retreat, go away for a weekend or for a week and listen to that voice. If you've got that nagging thing in the back of your head at the end of the day or the end of the week, if you're saying, 
man, I really need a beer. That's, that's time to listen to that little voice. If you say, I'd like to relax, think I'll have a beer. That's one thing. If you need a beer, if you need to go home and kick the dog, if you go home and take a nap, sleep through the weekend because you can't face what's coming on Monday, that's a wake-up call. Don't ignore it. Incredible. What do you hope your legacy to be? You know, I don't think a lot about that. Um, I've done a lot of things in my life. Some of them pretty good. Some of them not so good. But when it comes down to it, um, I hope that I've hope that I leave the world a better place for what I did than if I had never shown up, uh, like uh, Jimmy Stewart and It's a Wonderful Life. Um, my kids are incredibly important to me, and their happiness and success, in a way, is a a, a referendum. It's the report card on how I did. And so far, knock on wood, they're all happy. They're all living the life they want to live. And I still have really very, very close relationships with all of them. And uh, if that's all I ever did right in my life, that's 10 times more than I could hope for and probably 20 times more than I deserve. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. Oof, that's all I got. Fighting <laughs> ah. back tears. Oh gosh. If you are um if you are in the live audience right now and you are listening to Greg's story and have anything to say, comment, or question, I do welcome you to go ahead and shout something out to us right now. And um Hopefully, some of our audience. You get anything from Julian Cloverdale? That's my wife. <laughs> Don't listen to her. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll give everybody a few minutes to um, to say something because there is a la a bit of a lag too between the feed. Yeah. So. I do have one more question, actually. If you if you could go back and tell your younger self one thing, what would it be? Mm. Mm. Discover who you are. Find out who you are, Greg Carter, and make that your number one priority, and don't stop until you find the answer because everything else springs from that and I don't just mean who you are in terms of what you want to do for your career or what kind of lifestyle you want to have I mean in the deepest philosophical sense who am I what is the nature of myself what is the nature of life? What is the meaning of life? And when you know that, young Greg Carter, everything else flows from that. You don't need to know anything else. Life just unfolds. You'll respond. You'll adapt. You'll react. You'll do whatever needs to be done. And you'll be fine. And if you don't know who you are, you could have all the luck, all the love, all the riches, all the acclaim in the world. And you'll end up, like I can tell you, a little bit older version of yourself did, drinking a fifth of bourbon every night, smoking like a chimney, 300 <laughs> pounds overweight, and more or less trying to kill yourself. Hmm. So learn who you are, discover who you are, and that makes all the difference. Hope that wasn't too out there for you, Melissa. 
Oh, it's it's right where it needs to be. Awesome. And we we do have a question from a Julie Carter. Oh, here we go. <laughs> India. India. <laughs> oh, she's uh, referring to one of the times I uh, followed that inner prompting. The year after I sold the business, while still thinking I really ought to get a job or do something, I. Uh, Bought a ticket to India, uh, flying into Mumbai, and 30 days later, flying out of uh, in I can't think of the name of the country, Delhi, mm. flying out of Delhi, which are not super far apart, but uh, that was my entire plan. I had a hotel room for the first two nights, an Airbnb, and then I had a ticket for 30 days later to fly home. And I have my backpack and I traipse all over India by bus, train, foot, uh, domestic airline, just about uh, every way you can move about. And uh, I explored India. I went to temples. I went to Osho's temple. If you've seen Wild Wild Country, that was Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Went to his temple. Went to the Krishna Temple in Mumbai. Uh, went to retreat centers. Went to big cities. Went to small towns. Saw the Kumbh Mela, where literally millions of people come together in the course of a few days. Makes Burning Man look like a, you know, a couple of people gathering for coffee. And <laughs> wow. I went on a on a journey of sort of self discovery and discovery of other perspectives. I wasn't interested as much as I would love to in going to Europe and seeing other rich white people doing what rich white people do. I went to India. I stayed away from the rich white people area. Mm -hmm. I went into a cafe and there were Americans or Europeans. I turned around and walked out. I wanted to immerse myself in the experience. And that's what I did. And it was an awesome life-changing experience. Incredible. Incredible. So, you know, that's why I didn't have time for a job. I had to do stuff like that. <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for that. Right? <laughs> Work was cutting into my self-discovery time, so it had to go. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, 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 I know we're just probably the on the tip of the iceberg of how many stories you've got, but I just, I'm so thankful and grateful for you to be joining me here at the beginning of the show. And I just hope, I hope that more people, you know, will step up and want to participate and tell their stories. You know, you don't have to be a multimillionaire mogul in order to have an impact impact and an inspiration on somebody else's life and career. So I am so thankful that you have done this um, with me and for me. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> I really uh, have enjoyed talking with you and, it's kind of fun to look back over a whole lifetime and yeah. uh, pick out a few pieces that are hopefully entertaining or engaging. Well, it's it's been a good excuse to uh, to spend some time talking to you too, and learning some new things about you, and kind of revisiting our our past also. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm honored to be your first guest, and I wish you the best in the future episodes, and look forward to following you. Thank you. Yeah. Can I say one other thing? Sure. This is not exactly a plug, and it's certainly not a profit-making venture, but I've become really fascinated through this whole process with the idea of debt and what it means. And uh, I started a on-the-cheap blog on Facebook uh, where I and anybody that wants to join in are exploring uh, – big questions of life and death and what does it mean and talking about the things that people don't normally talk about. And uh, as I put it, I open the door and invite death in and say, here, have a cup of coffee, put your hood back and stay a while. So uh, we're having a sort of wide open conversation about death. And if anybody would like to join, uh, be happy to have you. Yeah. How, how can people find that? What's the, uh... um, 
Is it a, a there's a page? it's a Facebook page, and unfortunately, I don't remember the, the link for it, but I can give it to you, and uh, you can add it on at the end if you want. I, I know that I I like that page. I just can't find it right now, so <laughs> yeah. I will add it. I should have done that. I apologize. Uh, Sounds no, good. Yeah. I'll, I'll find the link and I'll add it to the show notes. It'll be easy for people to find. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good right, morning, so Mary. For anybody that is interested in joining Greg's conversation about death and life and all the things in between, um, you can go ahead and visit misfitsandmoguls.com and look for the episode with Greg Carter and you shall find the link. Okay. Thanks, Melissa. So thank you so much, Greg. I am going to remove you now, and I'm going to uh, talk briefly here about my next guest. Let's say bye, Greg. <laughs> bye. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Time to juggle here. So my my next show, there's no regular schedule here, by the way, because I am a single mom balancing all of the responsibilities of having a three-year-old on a rotating schedule. And so I am going to be fitting things in when I can. <laughs> so the next show is going to be uh, this coming Wednesday on January 20th at 2 p.m. And Brian Fees will be joining us. He is a graphic novelist and we'll be talking about turning tragedy into stories that sell. He writes graphic novels and draws, um, illustrates incredible stories and the reason why I know Brian is because he wrote let's see if I can import this uh, graphic really quick he wrote a fire story that is a story of the Tubbs fire from October of 2017 the same fire that destroyed my house so that's how we know each other and he has been um an incredible friend and we've done a couple projects together and so he's going to be joining on our next episode so please join us then and i am um uh, happy that this episode has gone as well as it has hopefully everything sounds okay if you have any comments or feedback go ahead and uh, leave a comment or send me an email through the website. Okay, guys, thank you so much. It's been fun, and I'll see you on the other side.